ഓം വക്രതുണ്ട മഹാകായ സൂര്യകോട്ടി സമപ്രഭ നിർവിഘ്നം കുറു മേ ദേവ സർവകാര്യേഷു സർവദ സരസ്വതീ നമസ്തുഭ്യം വരദേ കാമൂപിണി വിദ്യാരംഭം കരിഷ്യാമി സിദ്ധേർഭവത്തു മേ സദാ ഗുരുർബ്രഹ്മ ഗുരുർവിഷ്ണു ഗുരുർദേവോ മഹേശ്വര ഗുരുരേവ പരം ബ്രഹ്മ തസ്മൈ ശ്രീ ഗുരവേ നമഹ Hari Om and greetings from Niagara Falls. The word Krishna when taken literally means dark or black. Bhagwan Krishna's skin color is black or dark blue like a rain cloud. The word Krishna as in an applied meaning not the literal meaning but how this relates to us is the one who attracts and what's attractive about bhagwan krishna is that he knows his nature is happiness and that's why we're drawn to him when we know someone else's nature is happiness or that they express happiness we're attracted to them when we know who we are we will love ourselves more Another name for Krishna is Murari. You've all heard this name before. Murari when taken literally. Some people share that this is Bhagwan Krishna's enemy. But we have to be careful with that thinking. How can Bhagwan have an enemy? Yes. We keep studying about not having likes and dislikes. If our god has likes and dislikes then that can't be our god morari's enemy is krishna not krishna's enemy as morari morari would have so many enemies bhagwan krishna balrama and so on now the implied meaning of this mura means a thorn and not just an ordinary thorn a thorn that is twisted and ari means the enemy of or the one who ends that twisted thorn if you think about your decade thus far 9 days have passed what has been a thorn in your side what has been a a twist in your mind it would be the ego yes whenever our ego is acting up is flared up we feel that pain in the body we feel that stress in the mind and so morari is the one who straightens that thorn the one who softens that twist i'm highlighting these names krishna and morari because our course is not a course in literal meaning but the implied meaning for us to know what bhagavad gita feels like we have to be shastra anusari anusari means you have to be tied to you have to revolve around this scripture you have to read it you have to write about it you have to reflect on it and most of all you have to apply or practice this that's what it means to be shastra anusari what it means to go past dictionary terms and our approach to this course we're taking up verbs nine verbs that we're deeply engaged in like relating communicating working these verbs were already engaged in <coughs> plus insight that is knowledge jnana a verb plus insight equals joy you don't have to change what you're doing what you're already doing 
add insight, add meaning, add depth. And that is the experience of, of joy. That's the experience of Bhagavan Krishna in your heart. Last month, our focus was on relating. I'm sorry, it was on uh, relating, yes. Before that, it was communicating. And the first verse that we took up was chapter 6, verse 9. And nine different types of personalities were highlighted and cha. Cha means etc. A book that I'm teaching on Wednesday is called The Tao of Pooh. And one of the insights is, we are agitated by others when we're unable to change them. If we're able to change someone, then we're not agitated by them. But if we can't change someone, we want them to change, they're not changing, so we're agitated. We rarely appreciate someone for who they are. That acceptance is not there. And the shloka we took up to see that there's so many types of personalities and they should be appreciated and accepted for who they are. Our spiritual parenting retreat this year in October is being hosted by Chinmay Mission Fairfield. They're part of our study group right now. And I just came up with the theme, the vision of acceptance. Parents that accept their kids are happy parents. Parents that don't accept their kids are unhappy parents. So come to the retreat. <laughs> After that, we move to chapter 7, verse 7. A famous verse where we're all compared to pearls and there's a cord that connects all of us. Coming back to the Tao of Pooh. This is a very good book. You should read it or listen to the audiobook. Rabbit is considered to be clever. And a clever person is one who doesn't try to understand others. They never go deep into another person. Pooh is considered simple. A simple person tries to understand others. They go deep into that person. As long as we live in a worldly way, we will focus on the pearls and not the connection. But in this verse, we acknowledge that we're pearls, that we're all different, we're all natural, but what unites us all is life, is existence, awareness, joy. We then moved on to chapter 12, verse 15. And the main thought here was, as we relate to people, to not agitate people, to not disturb people, and not be agitated or disturbed by people. Yes? How you relate to people is unilateral. If I'm polite to you, it's not necessary that you'll be polite back. As long as I feel this is bilateral, I offer, you should offer back. That shows I've never understood how to work with people, how to live with people. In Srimad Bhagavatam, Raja Rishi Bharata is trying to share with Rahugana, there is no such relationship as master and servant. And he says to Rahugana, if you still think there's a master and servant relationship, what am I supposed to do about that? And that's such a subtle message that if I'm tuned into oneness and you're tuned into separation, what am I supposed to do about that? I can't control you. An awesome verse about letting go of this sense, false sense of control. We finally finished in chapter 3, verse 11, where there is an idea of the higher you serve, the more you will be supported. If you tune into all of humanity, the one who is above humanity, that is, the creator or infinity, 
will support you. As I was thinking about this verse today, visually, how many of you have been rock climbing before by a show of hands? How many people born in India have been rock climbing? Let me ask that question again. <laughs> All of the people born in India, why would you climb rocks? <laughs> Take the elevator, climb the stairs, why climb rocks? When you go rock climbing, you have someone who's watching you. You're a belayer, I think it's called a belayer, and they belay, which means that if you fall, you can't fall so much, only as much as the rope is uh, not tight. How I was thinking about this shloka is, suppose I'm living for my community right now, and I want to evolve, I want to love more, so I start living for society. God is my belayer. She, he will look after everything below what I'm looking after. Bhagavan will look after the individuality, family, community. So all we have to do is live for What's above us? And we will be supported in all that is below us. Okay? That's our review. We're now in a new month. And our new verb is working. When you hear this word work, what do you think of? Show me at least facially what you think of. <laughs> Don't smile, you're lying right now. <laughs> I'll uh, help you be honest with what you th you're thinking about in terms of work. How many hours a week do you work? Say 50. The bigger the city you live in, the more you work. The smaller the city you live in, the less you work. How many weeks do you work? 50. Yeah? Even over your apparent holidays, you were still checking your work email, still worrying about January 6th, yes? And how many years are you going to work for? Until you die, yes? <laughs> Put 50 years there. So 50 hours times 50 weeks puts you at 2,500 hours a year. For 50 years? 125,000 hours we are going to be engaged in work. Now tell me what you think about in regards to work. <laughs> See, now more of your honesty is being displayed. As you're engaged in work, how many of you feel that there is equality in your work? That you are treated respectfully for the work you do? that you're paid for how much you contribute, that all of the people that you work with are not as great as you are, including your supervisor, including your CEO. These are all uh, stereotypical notions that we have, very worldly. Now we need to study some shlokas about what work really is and how we should engage in our work. So we will go to the fifth adhyaya, to the eighth shloka. Five, eight. And really shloka nine is part of this too, but for the sake of consistency, we'll only take up one shloka. Everyone's with me. This is one of the most fun shlokas in Bhagavad Gita. It's great to uh, chant this, very rhythmic. Naiva kinchit karo miti. Naiva kinchit karo miti. Yukto manyeta tatva vit. Yukto manyeta tatva vit. Pashyan shrinvan sprishan jigran. Pashyan shrinvan sprishan jigran. Ashnan gachan swapan shwasan. Ashnan gachan swapan shwasan. 
what Bhagavan Krishna is telling Prince Arjuna. Na eva kinchit karomi iti. Someone who knows how to work, what do they feel? They feel that they are not working. That's so fascinating and lovely. Someone who knows work doesn't feel like they are working. So how is this possible? If you remember all that you are and all that you have, are you solely responsible for that? All that you are, yes or no? And all that you have, say your liberties, your dining room table, your family, you're solely responsible for all of that. As long as you feel you're solely responsible, you will feel that you are the doer. But how every life coach, every wellness workshop has an insight about being grateful. The more grateful one is, the less one feels they are the karta. The less grateful one is, the more they feel they are karta. Someone who knows how to work they don't feel that they're working, which means that they're deeply, perpetually grateful. That's very tactile. Today, some uh, uh, young adults had come to our home, boys. And one of them was telling me about uh, a conversation he had with his parents about when he gets married. And he said... When he gets married, he's not going to invite any of his parents' friends. He's only going to invite his own friends. He said, it's his marriage. Why should his parents' friends come there? And I, I know him, and I was born and raised in, in Canada, so I know the culture also. I shared with him, did you raise yourself? <laughs> and, and very specifically, are you going to be paying for your wedding? And all of a sudden, he was taken aback because he was waiting for me to validate what he was feeling. And I told him also, I said, when Sheila and I were dating, that I never even wanted to get married institutionally. And even when I knew I had to, I just wanted us to go to an ashram in, in Bharat and just us two and maybe our immediate family. But I know Sheila's family, so that also was a dream that I had that wasn't going to be <laughs> manifesting. So we really just said to our parents, you do whatever you want. And it was a really easy and enjoyable wedding and reception. And the thought process behind all of this is, we didn't raise ourselves. Our parents did, our parents' friends did. This is as much of their wedding as it is our wedding. So now again, come back to work. You engaging in work is almost like a tribute that you're offering back for everything that you are and that you have. And here I'm deepening this. I was joking around about professionally 50 hours, 50 weeks, 50 years. Does Bhagavan Krishna have a profession? Does he get paid for what he does? On the battlefield, is Prince Arjuna... Um, is he a prince? He's a seeker, no? So for all of us, you know that I don't have a professional life. I'm a professional volunteer. Many of you are students. You don't have a professional life. Many of you have taken up the great responsibility of looking after what's happening at home all the time. Older parents, younger kids, all of that is work. Okay? Okay. And uh, to be grateful for this opportunity. Bhagavan continues and says, Yukta manyeta tatvavit. How is it that one doesn't feel that they're working? Yukta. They're united. They're remembering. Manyeta in their mind, in their heart. Tatvavit. The truth. Existence. Nobility. In other words, they're 
personalities who enjoy creation. I'm picking on the word tattva. If you enjoy creation, you enjoy sunsets, you enjoy breathing, you enjoy eating, you enjoy all of the verbs we're studying, don't you owe it back to creation to further creation, to help creation? Yes? If you're enjoying freedom in America, shouldn't you be paying your taxes? Yes? In Canada, if you're enjoying a public school education that's of the quality of a private school, but you don't pay those fees, that tuition, shouldn't you be going to all of your classes? Yes? If you enjoy creation, and you will enjoy creation if you are grateful, then you will also carry creation. You will further it, you will help it, you will serve it, you will love it. You will not feel that this is work. You're all with me. Do you feel that this class is work? The way that you feel about washing dishes, the way you feel about commuting to work, do you feel this class, this class is the same? You're just saying that because Zoom, you know, there's a camera there. I should ask you to turn your cameras off and ask the same question, yes? <laughs> I hope you don't feel the same about this class. And the reason for that is we're not bringing our minds down from the creator, from creation. So there's no opportunity for stress, for anxiety. Next quarter, Pashyan. Show me Pashyan, point. Seeing. Shrnvan, show me. Hearing. Sprishan, slap the person next to you. <laughs> Jigran, smell the person next to you. <laughs> All of these uh, four verbs, which is seeing, hearing, touching, smelling, these are all generally known as the organs of perception. The jnana indriyas. That's what's being shown by Bhagavan Krishna because, again, we have these notions of work being sitting behind a laptop. But here Bhagavan is saying, work is seeing. You're seeing the water in your shower, hearing. You're hearing an infant crying, touching, combing your hair, smelling. The people on your commute. <laughs> All of that, that same mentality of being grateful, the same mentality of serving creation should be held. And if I can reference Srimad Bhagavatam, throughout Srimad Bhagavatam, the message is those eyes, those ears, those hands, the, that nose, that is not dedicated to Bhagavan, to the divine, they're really just holes for animals to live in. And that's a really uh, intense example that my ears, if I don't want to listen to the glories of Bhagavan, they're just ear holes for rats to live in. My nostrils are holes for, for bugs to live in. That's all they serve. In a deeper sense, it shows we don't know the value of being a human. And if we don't know the value of being a human, we won't live for enlightenment. We'll live for position, for possessions, for pleasure, but not peace. So what are you using your ears for? What are you using your eyes for? And he completes this thought in this shloka. Ashnan, show me Ashnan. Eating. Gachan, gachan means going. And you can take this more literally too. If you eat, you have to go also, yes? <laughs> and uh, then we have swapan. Swapan, dreaming or sleeping. And shwasan, breathing. 
these two combined means when you're unconscious and when you're conscious. These four verbs generally are taken up as if the jnana indriyas are presented, then what else is going to come? The karma indriyas. If there's perception, there's also going to be response. Eating, walking. Walking specifically is one of the karma indriyas. Karma indriyas. The earlier verbs really showing us that we should have a a arpana buddhi that we're using these strong organs like seeing and hearing arpana means to dedicate to the divine and if there's arpana what's going to come back also if there's nevedya what's going to come back prasada that's what's shown in the fourth quarter that whatever you get to eat to be cheerful wherever you have to go to be cheerful Wherever you have a place to sleep, to be cheerful. Prasada buddhi. Taking this more deeply, it connects back to last month. We should be using our karma indriyas, our organs of response to, to love, to love creation, to keep on growing our love from community to society to humanity. Because last month, one of you had a question. What is the tactile point? How do you start to serve humanity? How do you start to live for humanity? Use your organs for humanity. You should eat in a simple way so that you can feed more people. You should walk. You should be an environmentalist. Um, pu support public infrastructure more. Sleeping, you should sleep less. Because if you sleep less, that means you're working more, no? Breathing is be healthy. These are all tactile ways of uh, living selflessly, living beyond oneself. Okay? If you take this shloka up, and are not anusari. If you don't reflect on this, if you don't find practical ways of engaging in all of this, this is just another shloka out of 700 shlokas that is poetic, but not practical. Bhagavad Gita is known as Smriti. Smriti is an interpretation of Shruti. Shruti are is divine teachings that is not to be interpreted. This is to be directly internalized. But this is hard for us. When we start our Upanishad course, probably in September, so many will find this too abstract, too subtle, too demanding. Here's where Bhagavad Gita comes in, where that Shruti is interpreted by Acharya Shankara, by Gurudev, and in our course, we're also interpreting it to bring this into our lives. So that Bhagavad Gita is not just to sit in our library. Let's chant together. Naiva kinchit karo miti yukto manyeta tattva vit pashyan shrnvan sprishan jigran Pashnan gachan swapan shvasan. Oh.